Decision making is a crossroad that any gamer has had to deal with and overcome. Going all the way back to the first video game ever conceived, Pong, it is absolutely critical for the user to make decisions and use ample forethought to outplay and outlast their opponent. Fast forward to 60 years in the future and the point still stands, only now add in just a tiny bit of ray tracing technology and Fortnite as the game of choice. What's good everyone, it's me Dan once again and this time around we are taking an in-depth look at the decisions you make. I want to get you actively thinking about in-game decisions as every round of Fortnite is unique. Think about all the games that you've played and not any two of them have been exactly the same. This is why we need to build up strategic skills which allow you to think smarter, not harder. From deciding a solid drop spot to finding the easiest rotations into the next safe zone, we'll be taking a look at it all here in this episode. On a related note, if you're looking for more in-depth educational Fortnite content, I highly recommend taking a look at the InstaPro Pass over at ProGuys.com. Purchasing a Pro Pass will unlock a wall of content, mastery courses, and multiple live coaching sessions with real Fortnite pros. Once you buy the InstaPro Pass, my first course recommendation is the Arena Late Game, which similarly covers content related to decision making. Elevate your game today! Link, as always, is in the description down below. Let's kick things off by talking about drop spots. It's the first thing you need to do when you hop into the battle bus, ready to take on 99 other players fighting over the epic victory royale. I've encountered countless amounts of people who hot drop every single game, which if you aren't familiar means to drop right when the bus allows you to, landing at the first POI on the bus's random path. If you find yourself doing this out of boredom or lack of knowledge, I'm here to tell you to stop. Seriously, stop right now. That's the first mistake you're making, putting yourself at a statistical disadvantage right out of the gate. We need to think analytically, and it starts with acknowledging the bus path and how populated specific land spots will be. Think about all of the named drop spots on the map and consider how much loot is at each spot. Typically, the rule of thumb is more loot equals more competition. Paradise Palms, Tilted Town, and Happy Hamlet all come to my mind when I think of high loot density, which also is accompanied by stiff competition. Now, if you feel confident with your early game engagements, more power to you. But my goal in this video is to get you to think about securing more wins and less risky engagements. So having to fight more off spawn kind of defeats the purpose. To really hit this point home, let's take a look at Clix, who's playing trio scrim matches with spades and crims. Given that the loot at Pleasant Park isn't anything to fawn over, especially compared to the previously mentioned Paradise, Tilted, and Happy drops, it has a higher chance of being uncontested. The icing on the cake for this game specifically, Pleasant Park is a good 1000 plus meters away from the bus at its closest point, making it anything but a hot drop. With all these factors considered, it is clear to see why they were able to take control of this entire point of interest without any contention. Looting without the risk of early game fights, which basically boil down to 50-50s anyway, gives you much more time to loot, farm mats, and generally get stacked for the inevitable endgame. On the complete opposite side, we have Booga landing at Salty Springs. After a bus path that directly crossed paths with the popular POI, I'll just let you guys take a look at this. What? That's the Osco, guys. Guys, do not kill me, please. What am I playing? Obviously, some of his fans wanted a bit of airtime, but others were dead set on going for the kill. This example is a bit exaggerated due to the fact that not as many people will typically go salty in an average game, but the point still stands. People are not afraid to fight for the loot, and if you think you can't handle that, I highly suggest taking the more passive route. Now, it's worth noting that not all low density loot spots are going to have low competition off spawn. This is where the bus route comes into play, and for example, if the bus flies right over your potential drop spot right at the start, it will usually have more competition. You might not be hot dropping after listening to this video, but among 99 opponents, a handful of those people might just ruin your plans. So really think about this when developing your permanent drop spot, as you can learn the loot paths and have already determined the pros and cons of where you're landing before ever loading into the game. Once you do this, you'll be ready to survive more spawn engagements and move on to the next step, rotations. Rotations are an entirely different beast, and you can't always have a set rotation plan for many reasons. 
First and foremost, rotations are subject to randomness. Every single game you play will have a different safe zone. One game might pull you towards Polar Peak, while the next is all the way at Sunny Steps. Annoying, right? Well, it's something that all of us have to master if we want better results. Let's break this down into two parts, early game and late game rotations. For early game rotations, you can easily combat the random aspect of zones. Typically, early game rotations are much more limited in scope as opposed to later game rotations, so it should be much easier to come up with a plan before hopping into a game. Let me explain using Frosty Flights as an example. Landing Frosty Flights puts you on the edge of the map, which usually is accompanied by a long trek to zone. Although zone rotations can be like pulling teeth out, they are also very predictable. Looking at the map in its entirety, you can see that the zone can really only go up and or to the right. So what you'll want to do is have a plan for each scenario, a north rotation and an east rotation. When the zone pulls north, if you did your research, you'll be able to pass a house that has three chest spawns and a handful of floor spawns. Additionally, you'll get some huge coverage by running through the forest. Every little bit matters to give you the safest rotation possible. Now, if the zone pulls east, then you also have a plan. Again, doing your research pays off, folks. You'd know that there's about five chest spawns along the backside of Polar Peak. To accompany additional loot, traversing this path also has some dense forest cover, which also grants materials. Doing simple VOD reviews on players that land at Frosty Flights, such as Dubs and Mega or Stompy and Tashinkin, would have made these rotations glaringly obvious. This is important because if you land literally anywhere else on the map, finding pro players that land at the same spot would be a great resource to build your own rotations. On the other side of the equation, we have late game rotations. You've already outlasted a majority of the lobby and can practically taste the dub. Now it's time to hunker down and make smart decisions. These seemingly small decisions will ultimately add up and make or break you, so really try and pay attention. Late game rotations are much harder to quantify since, well, they're completely random and based off of your experience. So although there isn't a cookie cutter plan of action for every single late game rotation, hopefully we can build patterns and make well-educated decisions using those context clues. I'll say right off the bat, you can't hope to get lucky for every zone. In fact, it rarely works like that, and most zones will require at least some migration. But the truth of it is, using natural cover is one of your biggest allies in this game. Knowing the terrain you're about to push through is super important when it comes to finding the easiest and fastest rotation methods, especially when you're playing in stacked lobbies where watchful eyes are looking to tag rotators just like you. You should always be asking yourself, can I run along a mountain or structures, either man-made or pre-generated? If the answer is yes, then it is necessary to do so. You only get 500 of each material type in arena and tournament play, so wasting it all on a tunnel in the fourth zone is never a good thing. Think smarter, not harder. Let's roll some footage from an awkward rotate that Clix and his trio had to take on in a stacked trio scrim lobby. Clix realizes right away that he is in a bad spot and communicates to his teammates that they need to go now or the situation will only get worse. Not only does he acknowledge, he also looks around and forms a plan. Hug the mountain, he says, in an effort to create the least amount of resistance possible. Not much resistance yet, but there's still a huge stretch of distance until they are safely in the next zone. His teammates take some pot shots at the opponents also rotating to zone on their left, but Clix hastily calls them off in an effort to not cause more attention to themselves. Smart move, Clix. At this point, it becomes clear to Clix that they can't push past the mountain they've been using as cover this entire time. He decides to temporarily base up and allow his teammates to catch up. This is smart as he's already made the decision to use one of his impulses. Think of it as a trade-off using one impulse to safely rotate three people to zone instead of having to use, say, 500 mats to tunnel in a totally exposed zone at risk to AR or explosive spam. So much could go wrong, and at this point, the risk-reward of not using an impulse here is too high, so they opt to go for it. The entire rotation costs them one impulse in probably the most stacked scrims of North America. Clix even comes to his teammates as to why hugging the mountain is important, so if you don't want to take it from me, take it from the horse's mouth. By building up these rotational strategies, you will be able to traverse through the later zones, use less mats, and lower your odds of getting spammed by the entire lobby, a probable death sentence. When push comes to shove, not every situation will go your way. That's just how a 100-person battle royale works. There can only be one winner for each game, and not even the best players in the world can secure the victory royale every time. It's just, well, difficult, to say the least. With that said, you can always decrease the randomness that comes with BRs by using these tips. 
As you can probably tell, this video isn't rocket science, just some textbook rational deduction that if applied to your game more consistently, you will see results. Anyways, that's all from me today. If you guys enjoy the video, I would really appreciate it if you slapped the like on it. As always, subscribe and hit the bell if you want to see more content just like this one. It's your boy Dan, and I will see you guys in the next one.